are live and you are in for a treat today. I am, you always hear me say I talk to friends and that's what I do, but today, today is a really special day because these are two of, if any of you have ever watched um, Anne of Green Gables, one of my favorite movies and books of all time, there's this thing called bosom buzz buddies, bosom buddies, or, or just sacred um, friends. And these two women, they're beautiful, professional, um, incredibly experts in brain health. But more than that, they have the heart of functional and integrative medicine and they're dear friends of mine. And I am so excited to be here today with them. Today, we're gonna to be talking about brain health and I will be trying to watch the feed on the side so if you guys have questions or comments or anything you want to know, put it in the feed. And if I don't get to your questions, we can go back later, all three of us, and we can pop in and answer your questions. So feel free to comment, add questions, whatever you want to do in there. And um, just a little housekeeping. In a minute, I will introduce both of my friends to you formally. But um, if you need to find us, you can find us at my website is jillcarnahan.com. You know where to find me. Also, brand new YouTube channel where this will be played afterwards. And if you just um, search my name on YouTube, you'll find that and you can subscribe. And Dr. Godza, um, her website is suzannegodzamd.com. Um, is that right, Suzanne? Yeah, my Gazda Integrative Neurology. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Gazda Integrative Neurology.com, right? And then um, Dr. Rusk, I believe yours is your name, right? Uh, Eileen Naomi Rusk. Uh, dot com. And the clinic, healthybrain.clinic. Healthybrain.clinic. And I'll yeah. then put those in the comments so you don't have to remember that. This is recorded, so you can um, come back and watch it anytime. If you like it, please do share because I think we're going to have some great tips on brain health. And, you know, we talked a little beforehand on what we're going to do. And I want this to be like you guys were sitting in on the coffee shop and us just talking about brain health. So it's going to be fun and casual, but hopefully with some really practical tools um, for all of you. So before we start, I want to actually introduce these beautiful women. Um, Dr. Eileen Naomi Rusk on the upper left corner is a co-director of the Healthy Brain Program in Colorado. Um, she has so many credentials, so many things she's worked on, so this intro won't even come close to doing her justice. But what I love most is, I'm going to just talk from the heart, and she is someone who is so science-based and yet intuitive and has really been an advocate for decades on trauma and the brain and trauma and illness. And I love what she brings to Dr. Gods and I as more traditional allopathic doctors in the sense of understanding. Oh, there goes the earring. <laughs> um, right out of the ear. <laughs> There's the other. <laughs> um, so uh, she brings to us a lot of really great insight on how to um, help the nervous system change and how much that affects health and illness. And I know as I've gotten to know her, when I see patients now in the clinic, there's so often where we, we reach a threshold of, of wellness and, and ability to get well. And I always think of her, it's like I have her sitting on my shoulder saying, Jill, have you thought about trauma? Because there's often a component of trauma to these illnesses like autoimmunity and brain health. And we'll dive into that today. And then Dr. Gaza, um, she was in San Antonio and she recently moved here and we are so happy to have her in Colorado. And she is a um, functional integrative neurologist, which um, a lot of times my uh, patients will ask for specialists like rheumatology, gastroenterology, neurology, and they'll want a functional or integrative trained doctor. And it's actually hard to find great uh, functionally trained specialists. So we have such a gem here with Dr. Gaza. Um, both of her and I really believe in the power of immunoglobulins, and hopefully we can talk a little bit about that today. So go to their website. They have so many more credentials than I shared, but I love to get the personal uh, bit in there. And Dr. Russ, let's start with you. I'd love to hear just a little bit about your journey into um, where brain health and um, neuropsychology, like how did you get started? What got your interest going, your story? You know, when I look back, first of all, I'm so happy to be here. It's fun. It does feel like a little coffee clash. So thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, you know, when I think back, I think of a pivotal moment um, in my own life when I was really electrocuted. Actually, I was in a cabin in Northern Ontario. I was young. I was in my early teens. And lightning struck the cabin I was in, and it was 
partly in water. And I remember that feeling of electricity going right through my body. And the next few days were actually horrendous. I guess I dissociated. I didn't know it at the time. I hallucinated a bit. And I felt at that time I was just kind of reconfigured in a way. And it, um, it led me to uh, try to understand really more about how the brain works and how mental health works. Because that hallucinating for a few days was not fun. So that was a pivotal moment for me, a watershed time when I think I found my faith, because I have a deep spiritual practice as well, which I consider actually an important component of brain health. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, that's what integrated my, my interest in science. I actually uh, became convinced I'd learned more about brain health at that time, and I was very, very young. So I became a neuroscientist. Then I became um, a neuropsychologist interested in integrating brain, mind, and body. But there was always a spiritual thread when that day when I was hit by that lightning bolt in that cabin, I was like, I found faith. I remember that was kind of one of my first big prayers. So that's a small story. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Isn't it funny how often the trauma, suffering, very yeah. strange experiences are the drivers to push us in a direction we maybe wouldn't have taken otherwise. I Dr. totally agree. Dr. Goss, I'd love to hear you as far as how did you get interested in neurology and even medicine way back then, as far as medicine, then neurology, how the specialties goes. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, I too want to thank you, Jill, for this opportunity for us uh, to gather, to share, but also this incredible opportunity to work with both of you to try to change the lives of patients that are struggling so much. So thank you so much, both of you. Well, you know, I started off becoming a coach. Um, I never thought I was smart enough to be a doctor. And maybe I'm not, I work really hard though. Uh, I went to pharmacy school, got my pharmacy degree, and then said, no, I wanna become a doctor. And I remember going to speak to the Dean of the medical school and I said, Dean Pastano, what can I do to get into medical school? I want to be a doctor. I want to help people. And he looked at my transcripts and he said, you have a snowball's chance in hell of getting into medical school. So the reason I tell that story is, you know, I think the reason I'm here today is it's, it's God's grace. It's the power of the universe. It's how we are drawn to be and to do what we are called to do and live out our life's purpose. So, and I got interested in neurology. I did love neuroscience. I love the brain. But back then, you know, neurology was the specialty of diagnose and adios. Um, but I would be, I'm happy to tell you that that has changed. And then going into integrative neurology hasn't been a very long journey, but um, I just began to see that we had to find other ways to help people got interested in root cause and a lot of because of you which how you helped my daughter heal from a mold related illness and what i learned from you really brought me to where i am sitting right at this moment oh, i'm very grateful oh and so am i i feel like you too are some of the biggest blessings in my life because one thing i see in both of you is just the humility and uh the the thing is, the more we know, the more we realize all of us that we don't know, right? Um, and yet you both are so beyond brilliant in what you bring in the dedication and how you view the patient. And I know we all, like when we're sitting in front of the patient, to me that that is the ultimate humbling experience because the cases that we see are so complex. And if you're listening out there and you're suffering or you feel hopeless, I know one of the things we all talked about even before, and I'd love to hear your comments on for those people who are listening and feel like whether it's the pandemic that's caused a lot of disruption in their life or whether they're dealing with a brain illness or a neurological illness or another type of autoimmune disease or toxic mold or Lyme disease or any of these things, um, it's scary to be unwell and to not know, especially I've found personally when my brain wasn't working, I literally prayed to God with tears rolling down my face and said, God, you can take anything. Please don't take my brain. And I know if you're listening, some of you can relate to that and thank goodness, somehow he protected me. And I've had times of brain fog and word finding and all the things that you might be experiencing. But 
let's talk about that for a moment about the feeling that these people listening might be friends, family, or you as a listener, if you're suffering, what can we do to give hope and, and uh, courage? <laughs> You want to start, Dr. Gaston? Well, yeah. I've always said, and I'm probably not the one, don't quote me on this, because I'm sure many people have said this, but I've always said without hope, no one could survive. And that what is missing, I believe, in a lot of medical practices, we have brilliant colleagues, we have brilliant physicians, but it's the, the power of the heart. And I think that's one thing for sure the three of us have um, is we are very heart-centered. And when our patient sits across from us, I really think that that is a powerful healing force um, that is remarkable because maybe that's just the foothold that they need. Maybe that's just that one little piece that they can hold on to is, I know, Jill, that's how people feel when they come in your office and Dr. Rusk in your office as well. But absolutely, we are in a time of that we need this more than ever. Dr. Rusk? We need love more than ever. And I feel the same way about both of you. I love sending patients to you and working with you with patients because I know they're taking care of really heart, mind, soul, spirit. And just being seen and just being held in that way is incredibly healing for people to know that there are people out there who really hold love and see their unique gifts, qualities, wounds, and help turn those wounds into healing, into their own wisdoms that they can then share. That's, that's how I feel when I see patients as well. And you both do such a great job of that. Like I said, I feel the same as like, I know that when we share a uh, collaboration with patients, I know that they're gonna be so loved and taken care of. And I know like Suzanne and I, we recently had a, a gentleman that we both saw and he literally, I think you asked him about what brings you joy. And he, he wept and he said, this poor man has lost hope and we are hopefully going to do some things that will give him hope again. Um, Dr. Rusk, any uh, experiences or patients that come to mind, we can obviously keep it confidential, but just an experience that would, um, would kind of bring this home as far as giving hope or, or even some practical things you could do when you see someone like really, really at the end of their rope? Yeah. Um, it's hard to talk about specific patients, but sure. uh, yesterday a patient said to me that she felt, actually I shared this with, with, uh, with Dr. Jill. Yesterday a patient said, you know, I feel like I've only met a few really, really special people in my life. People who've come to me from the universe, from God, from source, in a way. And they, 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 they introduced me to Dr. Jill and they introduced me to you because you're the one who's, you're the ones who are going to buoy me, to hold me up and to usher me through this. You're the ones who've given me hope again. And I think it's true that a lot of our patients are at their wits end. They've seen sometimes a hundred providers. We've all seen patients who've seen a hundred providers who can't really get to the root cause or haven't looked for root cause yet. So I feel in that way too, we're willing to investigate, we're willing to do the deeper study. And more importantly, we're willing to take the time to see all of them and, and be on the journey with them. So it's, it's personalized, it's beautiful, and I'm so, so grateful to work with you. It's like finding sisters. Yeah, I agree. It's a soul sisters thing. <laughs> oh, so let's talk about practical. Um, you know, again, like I said, I know I always, my brain is my most precious organ. So I, and people, I think, uh, take it for granted because we think about, oh, I got a scab on my arm or I got a heart issue. I think we, they forget and they also forget, which we'll dive into this. The brain is connected to the body, which means if you have inflammation, if you have autoimmunity, if you have infection, if you have toxic exposure, any of these things, um, your brain, it can be affected. And what I found, so let's dive first into, say, we're, let's talk about like subjective cognitive decline. That's a fancy word that we medical people use for when you have some memory issues or you have some, you feel like you're not quite as sharp as you um, used to be. And I would love both of you to kind of, let's talk to the general person who's having some trouble. What would that look like um, 
when should they be concerned to come call one of us or another doctor in their life? What kinds of signs or symptoms would you say, hey, these are serious, take them seriously. Um, Dr. Gaza, let's start with you. What kinds of things would you recommend? Hey, go see someone about those things. Well, I always say that time is the essence when it comes to neuroplasticity and that we shouldn't wait until we're having a big problem, right? Um, to try to do something about uh, brain health. And I just don't agree with when a patient says, oh, honey, it's just, I'm just getting old. And I think we should have vivid, vibrant movie, uh, memories into old age. You see it in the blue zones, right? The people that live in the blue zones um, live in, into old age and are not developing dementia. So I, I think we should be concerned if we're not a short-term memory, of course. Word finding is probably the most common thing. But um, every single day we should be working on improving memory. We work, we work out, we exercise, we want to have our bodies be fit. We should be also uh, creating a protocol for brain fitness. When I was in neurology, you know, years ago, we were taught that the brain was, you got what you got. You couldn't teach an old dog new tricks, right? And that if you had a stroke, if you got MS, if you had a traumatic brain injury, so sorry, too bad, diagnose, adios. But in the 90s, which was the decade of the brain, that um, radically shifted. And now we know that, no, that's really not true. The brain really can heal itself. Mm -hmm. And that you know, that's my goal in this next decade of my career, if God gives me those years, is to really give people that hope that you may have been suffering for a long time, but there are definitely things that we can do to improve your brain function. We can build better brains every single day. I love that because that is the core message of hope. Um, and I know like I'll talk just real briefly about some of the practical and then Dr. Rusk, I want to know um, next from you, what kind of tips could people do to improve brain health? And this could be simple lifestyle things. I know we're all a big fan, fan of simple. And I've said this probably almost every time I talk, but I think like we start with clean air, clean water, clean food. I remember hearing Walter Crenian quote maybe a year or two ago before he passed away that 80% of our toxic exposure environmentally is air, nanoparticulates, so from fumes and gases and, and then of course indoor air quality with like uh, mold and other chemicals like off-gassing on the cabinets, formaldehyde, fluorine, laminate fluorine. There's so many things and people think, oh, new house, I'm gonna be great. New house is sometimes the worst for off-gassing the chemicals and then your old houses have mold. So really thinking about air quality, clean air, clean water. So drinking pure clean water out of non-plastic containers and clean food. And again, food is like, oh, does that really have to do with brain health? I always feel like that's a foundation. And I never have a one size fits all diet, but what I like to do is blow people's mind with plant-based paleo because people think of it as like bacon and butter paleo. And I eat paleo diet, but I am a plant-based eater. I only eat meat three times a week, potentially. I don't eat any red meat. Um, and it, not everybody has to have this diet, but I feel like the plants are so critical. Um, there are some people who get by with not a lot of animal protein, and that's okay. But I do find adding the eggs, the fish, uh, clean, you know, grass or uh, free-range chicken also really critical for most people. Um, what do you guys think? Let's talk real quick about diet. And then Dr. Rusk, I want to get to you about the special tips. What's your opinion on diet, Dr. Rusk? And what kind of a diet would you say is best for brain health? You know, plant-based diet is, is data-driven and best for brain health. If people can get their guts assessed mm -hmm. and get a sense of uh, uh, what's going on in their microbiome, do they have parasites, pathogens, fungus, candida? I feel like that there's so much uh, very, very strong literature now on uh, the, the health of the gut and the impact of the vagus nerve, which is that very long snaky nerve that, that travels from the gut to the brain and the brain to the gut. Very important. People think about it as, a, as really a highway, the highway between the gut and the brain. And there's so many ways to stimulate the vagus nerve in, in positive ways for both emotional health and, and for gut health and for brain health. So I, I know that wasn't your question, but I just want to mention that as it pertains uh, to well, that's perfect, but also vagus health. nerve, what, what could they practically do for that? Because I get that question all the time. What do I do for my vagus nerve? 
Well, I know the two of you are hysterical because you always have gadgets. You're the gadget girls. <laughs> Let's play this gadget. Well, I, I really wasn't raised in the world of gadgets. I was raised more in the world of what can we do in terms of social engagement, in terms of cognitive strategies, in terms of behavioral strategies. And so, um, you know, the social engagement network um, as the vagus nerve, there's a ventral and dorsal part of the vagus nerve. And so social engaging in a very calm and loving way engages the vagus nerve. Humming engages the vagus nerve. Singing does too. Singing in community does too. There's a, a, one of my mentors, Peter Levine, who's one of the fathers of, of modern uh, trauma therapy, has a, a sound that he uses. He may not have developed that sound, but he says it's the vu sound. So, so humming or uh, uh, vibrating this area is very, very peaceful for the nervous system and stimulates the vagus nerve. You guys have gadgets because I know Dr. Gast actually just gave me one which I tried, which I really liked. So let's think about how we can combine these things, these traditional social interaction, cognitive behavioral trauma release strategies to make the vagus nerve healthy, which directly ties to gut health and then directly ties to brain health. And, and all the other ways. And I, I want to actually go back to um, an important point about subjective cognitive impairment, if that's okay. Because yeah. Dr. Gazdi, you answered that question um, really beautifully and then spoke about neuroplasticity. But I guess my answer to the question, even though you didn't ask me particularly, is that I feel like it's important not to wonder. People wonder and worry and worry and wonder for ever so long. And no, I don't think cognitive decline is part of normal aging. And um, we know from a data-driven definition lexicon point of view, there's subjective cognitive impairment that probably many people who are watching this have maybe experienced at times. We have subjective cognitive impairment when we're like super anxious, when we're super depressed. Our thinking isn't right because there's this very beautiful relationship between how we think and how we feel. So sometimes you're, you have subjective cognitive impairment as you age and it stays that way, goes away, or uh, what's the word? It, it modifies day to day. That doesn't then lead to the next stages in progression, which ultimately can lead to Alzheimer's disease, but certainly don't necessarily. The next stage is mild cognitive impairment, which sometimes leads to, which sometimes leads to dementia. But the best way to find out is to get assessed, to see a good neuropsychologist and just get some data, get a baseline, get baseline data. Don't start once you're really impaired. So that's kind of a call for an invitation for everyone to sort of just get um, get serious about your thinking and nurture nurture your your mind and and care for your brain in that way by getting diagnosed. I love it, and I love that you're here, Dr. Russ, because Suzanne and I both you know allopathic model. We haven't um, been taught to give all this respect that's deserved to your field, but I love <laughs> that you've taught. No, it's so important. I love what you've taught us because we realize the critical component of a neuropsychologist in the game, in the assessment. And I know both of us, like we couldn't do what we do without you because you give us that assessment and you can recommend a neuropsychiatric evaluation and some of the other tools. And then even just the practical stuff, like you said, whether it's humming or breathing, um, you bring this integral part. And I love that with the vagus nerve, you're right, we have gadgets. I, I ran over to get one, I'll show you in a minute so you can all laugh at me. I um, love gadgets. <laughs> but, um, but what I was gonna say is, uh, some of these things are free and really practical. You don't have to have a couple thousand dollar device to do it. So I love that. Dr. Gaza, I want to give you a chance to chime in on vagus nerve and food because of the practical things. What would you advise your patients with some sort of uh, cognitive issues on diet first and then um, vagal nerve or any sort of practical tips? I, I wouldn't change the, um, the recommendation that you have. I love it. You know, we know now a healthy gut means a healthy body and a healthy brain. Leaky gut means leaky brain. The blood brain barrier is very affected by gut health. And we know that some neurodegenerative diseases, maybe all, for sure, Parkinson's disease probably begins in the gut and then travels via the vagus nerve to the brain. So absolutely, diet is the foundation of mm -hmm. health. And so is exercise, you know, movement increases um, neurotrophic factors, BDNF, it's kind of the miracle grow for your neurons. 
Sleep is so important. And nobody, most people don't get enough sleep. Uh, you can say I'll sleep when I die, but you really will die younger, I'm afraid. Um, and sleep disordered breathing is also very common as you age. So we've got to know what our oxygenation levels are. And I agree with you too. It is the perfect storm that brings down the brain. It's never one thing. And Dr. Bredesen has shown us that, right? That it's the 36 holes in the roof. It's your environment. So it's your epigenetics. It's your diet. It's your gut. It's how you handle stress. It's your relationships. It's all of those things. And that's why it's so complicated. That's There'll right. never be a pill. We know that for Alzheimer's disease. So we have to be taking these steps and following these foundations of health early because we know that Alzheimer's disease, there are 30 million people in America suffering, not from Alzheimer's, but from cognitive impairment. Um, it probably begins at least two decades before presentation. Yeah, so if we could get patients in our office in their 30s and 40s, I get so excited when I do get these younger people, and I tend to have a practice more in deep toxicity issues, so uh, chemical toxicity, uh, heavy metals, and definitely mold, um, which is so toxic to the brain. I want to specifically talk about mold, but we'll table that just for a second. I am getting so many fun ideas as I hear you guys talk, because I want to talk about trauma too. So I want to talk about trauma. We'll go, come back to that. We'll come back to mold. Um, one little thing on the diet when I mentioned the paleo. Paleo, if you don't know, is grain-free. Um, again, not everybody needs to be grain-free. A lot of people can tolerate like quinoa and rice and some of the non-gluten grains. I recommend nearly 100% of my patients go gluten-free dairy-free, sugar-free, alcohol-free. That's kind of a baseline for my patients because I see so many inflammatory complications from those foods. Those foods actually have the ability to create gluteo and caseomorphine, which acts like a drug on the body if you have a permeable gut. So because I just think that's a pretty simple, basic thing to do in the beginning, I'll usually start there. And I wanted to mention one of the reasons I think paleo is so successful is not just because it's grain free, but because grains are the most kind of common food source contaminated with mold toxins. And I actually think part of the reason we see such success with paleo diets is the fact that you're actually eliminating a major source of mold in your diet. So it's interesting. Um, let's talk trauma really quick. I'll just show you really quick. This is my <laughs> gadget. Be a light, and I won't put this on. <laughs> How funny I look. So if you can see the little red lights, those are stimulating my mitochondria in the brain. I use this. I used to use it every day when I had mold. Now I use it maybe once a week if I have, like I probably should have used it before this interview and I wouldn't be so silly. But <laughs> But anyway, that's called a Via Light, if anyone wonders. And you can get those. They're kind of expensive, and I don't think you all need them. Um, there's other ways, like Dr. Rusk and Dr. Godza said, that you can – that's not a vagal nerve stimulator, just to be clear. That's right. our red light therapy that goes right through the skull. There's a piece I didn't show you that makes it even more funny. Right up your nose. It goes right up your nose, and there's a light that shines right into my brain. Um, but I'll tell you what, just me personally, that's an alpha Via Light. has really – when I was in the midst of mold – um, I tried a lot of things like binders and clay and charcoal and stuff. And that device actually, for me, really, really helped to turn on my brain without a lot of, with no drug or, or chemical effect. And it doesn't work that way for everybody, but um, we have studies on red light and the yeah. brain. Do either one of you want to comment on the red light and the brain? I know you've both seen all the research. Yeah. And, and I don't know, Dr. Gast, if you have any via lights in your office. But we do, we have the gamma. They have one now that's an alpha and gamma. Um, you know, I like to use that again as like a tertiary thing. I feel like all the things Agreed. we talk about in people's lives, internal factors that are root causes for uh, dementia or cognitive problems, external factors that are, you know, that are, that are root causes as well. I like to deal with those first. And I consider this like a tertiary treatment, even though it's so super fun. But yeah, we use the gamma for patients who have Alzheimer's disease or uh, any type of neurodegenerative illness. And I don't know the indication for other neurodegenerative illnesses, but I do know about it for Alzheimer's disease. And there's some very good data now, actually with Parkinson's disease as well. Um, so I like to pair it with cognitive stimulation, one of the neuroplasticity exercises. I and love it. <laughs> I like to pair things. For, to optimize neuroplasticity, I like to pair something like photobiomodulation with cognitive exercises or pair meditation with exercise or cognitive training after you've oxygenated the brain and increased the brain-derived neurotrophic factors 
then to exercise. So that's another brain health tip that I think people can, can take into their lives. Think about pairing things. I love it. And I know if you notice, she threw in a word there, it's called biophotomodulation. That's the name of that, the technical term. Um, Dr. Gaza, any comments on biophotomodulation or any other like vagal nerve stimulation, anything technical that's fun and progressive, but maybe more advanced? <laughs> well, I remember one time you sent us a picture of you wearing your um, <laughs> device while you were driving to the coffee shop. I thought that is so smart. Just... She's a time saver. The other day, um, I had a mask that looks like a Friday the 13th movie and the Via Light. And I'm like, I'm going to walk the dogs. And I don't care what people think of me. And my neighbor, she looked at me. Like, <laughs> and it, I don't know what I was thinking. But I, I think uh, my neighbors think I'm a little crazy. But it was quite <laughs> fun to see the reactions. <laughs> oh, your dogs love you. <laughs> well, it's an exciting field. Uh, photobiomodulation. I think we're just scratching the surface and, and what this may offer. Uh, so I agree with both of you. The Neurogamma device and the studies that they've Vialite has done, I mean, reducing amyloid plaque, reducing neuroinflammation. So I, I totally think we should keep it in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, you know, breath work also is an easy way for to reset your vagal nerve. I mean, anybody can do that. They treat, train the Navy SEALs that on day number one. Wow. is how to do breath work. So, um, but definitely it's important because, you know, I think COVID has cast upon us. It may be a tsunami upon a tsunami. Now we were already dealing with high levels of uh, neurodegenerative disease, neuropsychiatric disease. And Dr. Rusk and you and I have talked about this is that are we ready for what, will, what COVID will bring? Yes, yes. Um, so all of these, all of these tools are going to be very, very much needed. Very needed. Mm. And you know, it's interesting with the vagal nerve. One thing that people may not be aware of, and I was actually surprised in understanding this recently, um, tick-borne infections and viruses can actually infect the vagal nerve. And so we often, years ago, I would see a lot of cases of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in Lyme disease or chronic infection. And I knew that there was a correlation, but I didn't really understand exactly how that worked. And now I'm understanding that Ehrlichia and certain uh, forms of Borrelia and certain viruses like CMV can actually infect the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, uh, it deals with the motility of the small bowel. And so if you have that altered motility due to the infection in the nerve, you have this stagnation. It's like a pond that has no outflow and then pond scum builds up. And that's when you get this overgrowth of things in your back, in your small bowel, then that affects your digestion and ability to get nutrients and causes all kinds of things, creates some toxic waste that goes to your liver and then can go in and have problems with the brain. So it really is a cascade of events. And you wouldn't necessarily think like, what does Lyme have to do with vagus nerve? But a lot of patients who have Lyme disease, co-infections, other viruses, um, they actually have a lot of vagal dysfunction. And so we're treating the gut, but I love that we're talking about the vagus nerve because the real root issue is the vagal nerve dysfunction. So I love that we're talking about that. Um, Dr. Rusk, you're an expert in trauma, and I love that, again, you've really brought an awareness in my life to this, um, and there's two types of trauma. There's the trauma like a concussion, like a physical trauma, but there's also the psychological trauma, and I'd love for you to dive in, and I'll just frame it because I'm just really simple, and especially the way I started, I thought, oh, I'm fine. I had a great childhood, no trauma, right? Um, but I want to frame it um, for you listeners, because often you can have a great childhood, wonderful parents, and we all have some trauma. And that could be uh, your perception at a certain age of a, a, some sort of a situation and how it affected you and how you felt about yourself or the world or whatever. But I'd love, Dr. Rusk, if you want to talk just a little bit about trauma in the brain, because I feel like this is a missing piece in functional medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will, I will speak to that just a little bit. Um, I guess I want to say that we all have adversity and we all have challenge. And uh, some people in the field call them micro traumas. Some people call them micro traumas and macro traumas, big T, little T. So I think Dr. Jill, what you were speaking to is, yeah, we all have um, uh, you know, family members, maybe parenting that we had when we were younger, maybe even birth trauma experience that didn't really jive with our own individual nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll start there. Um, sometimes, of course, it can be more extreme, uh, sadly, with 
children who are neglected, which is a big type of trauma. And people don't often look at neglect um, as trauma, but, but being forgotten about and not being seen. Mm -hmm. I think that like both Dr. Gazda and you, Dr. Jill, agree that one of the biggest healers is to see people. Yeah. And sometimes they've come to us just to be seen or their longing is just to be seen. I think that's true for all of us. Um, so sometimes neglect in childhood can, can actually leave the imprint of a very big trauma. And um, I think a new, relatively new field that I've been interested in for several decades is intergenerational trauma or ancestral trauma because we do carry imprints, both physiologic in terms of illness states. In fact, I was just reading an article today on ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, and the impact that, that it, it brings with it an ancestral piece sometimes. So I think it's good to just consider that um, we are uh, just one link in a long chain and that sometimes we do bring trauma with us as well. Yes, from early childhood, so I think a lot of functional medicine and integrative practitioners should have a trauma-informed eye on their patients and some tools. And also just for, for listeners and for everyone to be more sensitive to our reactivity, how angry we get, how sad we get, those can all have roots in trauma. And trauma, yes, directly in fact, it impacts the gut, directly impacts the brain and the relationship and conversation between the two. Yeah. And again, I feel like functional medicine does a great job of looking for root cause. So toxicity or infection or inflammation, and they give credence to trauma. But to me, it's, it's not just a side thing. It's maybe one of the most important things we could do. It's like the soup. I see it as kind of like the stew that everything else brews in the immune system, our inflammatory reactions, the permeability of the gut. It's like the stew, the soup, the broth that everything kind of stews in that somehow a blind spot sometimes. Yeah, I'm going to actually share a thing that you sent me right before our, uh, it's just like a beautiful diagram of the whole functional medicine view of the brain and trauma. And then I'd love for both of you to comment because it it's gives a little much. Talk about. No, it's beautiful. Kind of fun. Hopefully you can also, can you guys see that? You yes. Know? I won't leave it up for a long time because then you can't see us talking, but um, Dr. Gaza, you've just seen this now and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you're an expert. Um, isn't this a great way to look at this is from Dr. Rusk? Um, and I would love to know uh, any comments on this, but I mean, this really gives us like an overview of how we're looking at our patients. And then Dr. Rusk too, I'd love for you both to comment on this. Great what diagram, Dr. Rusk. Uh, this to me is the perfect storm right here. Uh, it's all of these things that can lead to neurodegenerative disease or brain health uh, reasons. So, I mean, you, we could talk for an hour on each one. That's right. They're, they're individually uh, equally as important depending on the patient. Mm -hmm. like, and let's use an example. I mean, I think that if we look at this model, as Dr. As Dr. Gasta says, they're all relevant, mm -hmm. but some are going to be bigger or stand out more with certain people. So some listeners might be, say, might be like, oh, uh, I'm very toxic. I have a lot of toxins in my environment and that's really what's leading me to have my cognitive or brain health issues or put me at greater risk for brain health issues later on. Some people might say, oh, I've had, I had a patient this week, had maybe 13 head traumas. That's going to kind of be the, the lead magnet that is the focus that any of us will focus on as we look for root causes. And I want to give credit to our mentor, certainly a mentor of mine, and I know yours, Dr. Bredesen, who really helped make us look at the bigger picture. We all felt it, we all knew it, but it's this approach that I think was inspired and you know, fertilized by him looking at brain health uh, from a functional medicine point of view. And he uh, changed things around with his aging paper in 2014. I think that was the date of that aging. Yeah, paper. and great recall. And thanks for Thank sharing. You. You know, what, um, th first of all, this is great. I was so glad you shared it because I think it really gives our listeners a visual of the, the kind of like what we're thinking when we see them and how we're really looking at all the pieces of the puzzle. And we, like you said, we may start, what I always do is like, oh my goodness, there it might be a, a major infection or there's mold in the house. So we'll start with those big players and then um, kind of as those things get resolved, go into the make sure, well, sleep is a pretty big player, food is a pretty big player. So at the same time, we're looking at all those factors. 
And it's not a magic pill. It's literally how many hours of sleep do you get per night? What are you putting in your mouth for food and water? It's really, and it's kind of exciting because you don't have to pay $10,000 for a pill. You actually can just change your diet and get some traction on your brain health. And to me, that's exciting because it's, it's accessible to everyone. It's uh, really, really accessible. Yeah. Um, so let's talk uh, in the last few minutes. What about resources? No, I know Dr. Rusk, both of your websites are loaded with resources. And I'm going to be sure that in the notes and in the uh, chat box here, we will have all of those um, websites. But um, any favorite books that you recommend for patients? You mentioned Dale Bredesen's book. Um, if you look up Bredesen on Amazon, you'll find it. What's the name of his book? The End of Alzheimer's is, is the first book. I think there's another one coming out, though. The, yeah, his second book just was released. I think it's called... Uh, it's a program. Uh, yeah, Brett is in the Alzheimer's Protocol or something like that. Definitely recommend those two. Um, I rec yes, yes, yes. I just want to say, Jill and Naomi, I think what we're dealing with, we are living in the 21st century of immunodeficiency. And it's shocking to me how impaired most people's immune system is. I mean, COVID showed us that, right? You know, why, why should you get COVID? Obviously, you were immune impaired for some reason. It just wasn't bad luck. Mm -hmm. But even look at autoimmune disease. One in five Americans has autoimmune disease now. Mm -hmm. That, and, and, and this new disease, pans and pandas, neuropsychiatric disease, that and even a new specialty now, psychoneuroimmunology. That's right. That we have really got to get our immune systems healthy. Yeah. Um, and this is more important than ever before. And it's really because we live in such a toxic environment, our immune systems are just totally overwhelmed. And yes, it's stress. And yes, it's trauma travels. Uh, it's all of these things. And knowing all of these things is truly how we can help people heal. I love that. And I love the, the sw I always say we're swimming in toxic soup. And I always compare 20 years ago when I first started doing functional medicine, we'd have a patient come in with Hashimoto's or menopause symptoms. I'd do a little hormone work, maybe a slight change in diet, take out gluten, they get better. I don't see that anymore, period. No, I, I think we all agree. It's really scary. I really yeah. feel like people need to be focusing on you're the first person who said it. It's simple enough. Clean air, clean water, clean food. And I also like to say clean thinking. I mean, how our mindset is so important in this equation. And we sometimes forget because we are in a toxic soup. We also have choices about, you know, our thoughts. Yeah. Well, our you know, that's a great way to kind of wrap our last, you know, five to six minutes or so. Let's wrap up with stress. And the stress effect, first of all, I'd love if you guys have any studies or ideas or just background stress. People are like, yeah, everybody has stress, right? What, what, how does that affect our bodies and our brains? Because I think this isn't talked about enough. Dr. Gasta, you go first. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Rest, you are the expert. I am not. Yes, you have. I, I'll just briefly say, sure. you know, stress is as bad as smoking. You know, it's really, it's something that needs to be greatly recognized. And again, not to, not that this is a discussion about COVID-19, but I think stress and fear uh, are now at a higher level collectively across the globe. Um, and if we don't deal with stress, then we are, that's a great way to bring down your brain. Mm -hmm. No question about that. Dr. Ross, can you come? Yeah. The stress science has revealed that it has an incredibly uh, impactful effect on our immune systems, our cardiovascular health, our obesity, and, uh, and of course, our brain health. There's a very interesting new paper on um, how we think negativity, negative thoughts. It's actually, I think, a 2019 paper on patterns of negative thinking. I just wrote a little blog on it. Mm -hmm. and, and increases in amyloid and tau, some proteins that are markers for the development of Alzheimer's disease. So what was found was that patterns of negative thinking, and this is a quite a recent paper, 
patterns of negative thinking as opposed to positive thinking. And I'm not suggesting that you change your mindset and you change your thoughts automatically because that's a superficial, not possible thing override to do. We are who we are. We have to be compassionate and gentle with how we think, but to become more aware of our thoughts. Because in this paper, what I was saying was that they showed in patients who didn't have Alzheimer's disease or any diagnosed neurodegenerative illness, um, there was an increase in amyloid and tau, if you both know the paper, I'm not sure, in people who had negative thoughts, repetitive negative thinking. So I think our, our mindset, our thoughts hold so much power. And that's why I'm a firm believer in getting to know your mind, nurturing your mind, managing your mind with things like breath work, mindfulness practices, prayer manages your mind too, settles, focuses, and is, um, allows you to have some empowerment over what you think. Include that in your everyday neuroplasticity protocol. I love it. Um, what about, like, I would love to know, I know everybody always is, it's funny because I get calls at the office, uh, what washing machine do you use, Dr. Jill? <laughs> I'm like, well, who cares what washing machine I use? <laughs> but people want to know for you two and for me, what do we do? What do we do to combat stress? What do we take? So That's I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to talk just briefly about like mind body things. And then if there's any like basic supplements that you wouldn't go without or basic practices, what's your daily practice that you would never, never, or you, you know, really try to incorporate Dr. Gaza, do you have any uh, tips or things that you always try to make sure that happen every day for you? Well, now that I'm here in Colorado, I can say I'm so grateful that I can get out in nature mm -hmm. every day. There's something incredibly healing about the connectivity of nature and realizing that every little living thing matters. Um, good sleep. Uh, don't call me after 10. I'll be in bed. I'll be asleep, <laughs> Dr. Rusk. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes, Dr. <Yeah, that's> right. <laughs> you have one night owl in the crew, and can you guess who that is? <laughs> I love to the ends of my uh, every every ounce of my being. Um, I'm a giver. I guess I, my weakest link is self care. I need to do a better job of really nurturing myself, but. Um, Supplements, oh gosh, vitamin D3. Now vitamin C, quercetin, omega-3, uh, making sure my vitamin D levels are good. Mm, a few others, but those are probably the ones I would mention. Mm -hmm. And having friends like you and yeah. loving my life. I feel like that too. Yeah, Dr. Rusk, what about you? What are some daily tips that you do? And then if there's any supplements, if not, that's okay too. Well, I want to re remind us that everything Dr. Gasta said was in this matrix of brain health, yeah. really, even, even to the point of being able to rely on friends. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what I do, I really need to move my body and I need to move my body in different ways. Yeah. And I need to do, I love to do yoga and I love to walk and just be in nature and attune to the rhythm of nature. I think that's what's most helpful to me to attune to the rhythm of nature and feel the kind of the rhythm of the earth. I think that slows me down enough. Um, I take supplements. Um, I love my family. I love my friends and you are the dearest and closest to me. Um, I pray. I read a lot of sacred texts. I try every morning to make sure that I, I thank the universe and I thank all those mysterious forces for bringing me back into my body. I say a special prayer after I wake up. So those are some of the things I do. I really, really eat well and cook a lot. I love feeding other people. Yes, that I have my stress. That. <laughs> It reduces my stress. I have to tell a little secret because people like these fun stories. So sometimes Dr. Russ cooks for me and she gives me these containers they're all glass, so they're non-toxic. And on the lid, she'll write, she'll have a special dinner. And like one time, the first time it happened, I cried because do you know how special that makes you feel when someone writes in permanent marker on a gift meal on her special glass dishes? I literally was like, this makes me feel so special that you wrote my name on it in permanent marker. <laughs> <laughs> and she does. She's a great cook. And she, that's one way she loves people is to, to feed them. I, and I've been privy to it because I forget to feed myself. And she's like, sweetheart, have you eaten today? 
So I love it because you really do love people well that way. Have I cooked for you, Dr. Gaston? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> the morsel I've enjoyed. So I'm that's blessed. I'm so blessed. blessed. I also realized that I have methylation issues in my family. So I'm kind of, I mean, I'm pretty aware of um, certain familial issues, speaking of ancestral physiology yeah. that I carry. So I take a, a really good methylated complex and um, D3. I take K. I have a little bit of uh, heart, heart uh, disease, early heart disease, familial again. So I take a lot of omega 3s, C, uh, quercetin, some lysine sometimes, those kinds of things. Oh, good. These are fantastic. Also on identical hormones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I would just echo sleep for me is like number one. I can do anything. I can be superhuman. Not really, but you know, if I get a good night's sleep. And what's funny is years ago when I was so sick before you with Crohn's and all that, and even before that, when I didn't know I had celiac and I was eating gluten, I needed like eight or nine hours of sleep. Now I can get six and a half or seven, as long as I get lots of deep and REM and I get plenty, like two hours or so, I can actually feel really great at six or six and a half or seven hours because the efficiency is so good. So I think over my lifetime, I've gone from, you know, probably very low efficiency at nine hours, same amount of REM and deep. Now I can get six and a half or seven and, and like squeeze it in. But you really need to look at not just the total time. We, I don't know, most of us have an aura ring, which is a ring that tracks our sleep. That's a great device. There's other ones out there, but this one's really cool because it can show you deep and REM and it can show you your heart rate variability, which is a whole nother topic we'll have to come back to. Um, it can show you respiration rate, your uh, activity during the day. I love it. And I literally wake up and like, how did I sleep? Even though I should know because I wake up. Um, I think a little coffee is good. And I drink really, really clean mycotoxin free coffee um, in the morning. I love acetyl L-carnitine because it's a precursor of my favorite neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Um, and sometimes I'll combine that with herpazine, which prevents the breakdown. So I have more, you know, focus and concentration. Um, and then like they mentioned, B vitamins, vitamin D, zinc, um, minerals for me, I tend to deplete in minerals because I don't absorb well. So I love minerals and, and some of the basics. Um, some of the basic detox stuff would be N-acetylcysteine and lipoic acid and milk thistle and glutathione. And not everybody out there will tolerate all those. And I don't recommend just getting everything we say. You really need to individualize. And there's no amount of supplements that can out- um, work a poor diet or lifestyle. So that's why we didn't talk a lot about pills because everybody wants, what supplement should I take for the brain? And it's not that easy. That's right. Yeah, so, really good. Thanks for not, thanks for not doing that because really it's a whole, it's a whole life we can alter and change for positive neuroplasticity to happen. It so is. And yeah. I want to honor your time. So we'll, um, we'll close here in a minute, but any last parting words of wisdom, um, or hope giving to our listeners today? I would just say that life should be good. Um, it, sh it should be full of joy. We should have vibrant health. It should be this constant state of enrichment. Mm -hmm. We're always learning. We're always growing. Mm -hmm. And we're always loving more deeply mm -hmm. and honoring mm -hmm. our true sense of purpose mm -hmm. and why we're here. Thank you. That is so well said. Dr. Rusk? I think that's a great... Um, that's a great summary of, of brain health because brain health is really uh, lifestyle health, emotional health, mm -hmm. mental health, and so often we don't equate those. And I want to invite people to really start thinking about their nervous systems and what they want their, how they want to feel, how they want to think. And I feel like that's not something we're taught about yet. We're not, we're not taught much about uh, paying attention to how we feel, but start just becoming more self-aware um, how we think, how we, how we feel, and, and know that that's kind of a, the basis of beginning to take care of brain health. Yeah, wonderful. Well said. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. I know we're going to do this again sometime, so you guys stay tuned. And if there's things that you want to hear more about, more topics, more questions, mm -hmm. send them in because I will be sure and uh, hear you. So thank you both today for your time. Thank you so much thank for you so much, Bye, y'all. Bye, everybody. Bye.